Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving one, God of might and mercy, the heavens and the earth are full of your glory. Your love transforms our lives. You take darkness and give light. You take grief and give healing. You take fatigue and give strength. You take fear and give courage. You take death and give new life. So we come before you in worship, handing over to you all that weighs us down, waiting for your refreshing gifts. And so renew us in this time of worship, we pray, so that we may serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. O oh God, we confess that our lives do not always reflect your transforming power. You were gracious, but we cling to judgment. You were kind, but we can be cruel. You are forgiving, but we nurse grudges and old wounds. You were filled with joy, but too often we are filled with dissatisfaction and complaints. Fill us, O oh God, Fill us with your Holy Spirit this day and make us new through Christ, your Son, our Savior. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Collect for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. Almighty God, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us so to proclaim the good news of your love that all who hear it may turn to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Exodus. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry land, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and clouds looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, 
Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. A reading from Matthew. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their lord all that had taken place. Then his lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. What an extraordinary gospel reading. I mean, think think about the story for, for just a second. There's, there's a fellow, a servant, a slave, who owes his master thousands of talents. I mean, this, this debt is so big that at the average daily wage for a servant in those days, it would have taken him thousands, thousands of years to pay that debt back. And yet when the king calls in the debt, this servant kind of throws himself in front of the king and says, listen, just give me a little time. I'm good for it. I'll pay it all back. Thousands of years. I'll pay it all back. And, and the king who figures that this slave has got chutzpah, I, I think he smiled and, and said, okay, you're, you're forgiven. So, so having been forgiven a debt he couldn't possibly repay, he goes down the stairs, out into the dusty streets, runs into a friend of his who owes him a little bit of money, grabs him by the throat and says, give me what you owe me. 
And his friend, using the same word, says, just give me a little bit of time. I I'm good for it. And, and this lout has his friend thrown into prison until he can pay back the debt. And if you think about it, you don't make much money in prison. Uh, where do you go with that story? And I gotta tell you, I preached a lot of really bad sermons on this over the years. Uh, and I apologize to anyone who I ever made feel guilty because of your inability to forgive. Because it kind of sounds like, okay, you got a God who's gonna forgive you um, because you're, you're, you owe a lot, you're a bad sinner. So you're gonna get your sins forgiven and then you go out. But if you don't forgive somebody who's done something to you, then God's gonna take back the forgiveness. You're going to hell. That doesn't bode well for us and it gives a pretty bad image of who God is. It doesn't make sense. So I think after 46 years of doing this, I think I finally figured out what the heck this story is about. And, and I think we've got to do this by going back to the Old Testament lesson. We have been looking for weeks at the story of the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt, their liberation from slavery. And, and that story, I told you, was the defining story of the people of Israel, how God set them free, led them to the promised land, and said to them time and time again, remember, remember, remember. Remember the story of your liberation. Remember me, the God, I'm at the center of the narrative. And remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. Now, why did they have to remember that? Because it was a good story? Well, it is, but no, that's not the reason. Because it was a good excuse to have a big family meal once a year in the springtime? Well, it is, that's not the reason. Because it told them how much God loved them? Well, it does, but that's not the reason. They had to remember that they had been slaves in Egypt so that they would never, ever allow anyone to live that way again. They were called to go into the promised land to build a nation where no one would suffer from poverty. No one, no one would live with the shame, the humiliation of being slaves. They were to build a nation where no one would do without. So how did that go? Okay for a while, but later, not so well. 34th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. King Zedekiah, he is in control of the country. And, and, and there is no justice. There is no justice in the land. There is incredible poverty Hebrew men and women are living in slavery because they defaulted their land to creditors. And they were forced into what is called debt slavery. And, and it's horrible. And God, through Jeremiah, says to Zedekiah, listen, dude, this is awful. I, I told you that I was the God who brought you out of Egypt and you didn't pay any attention. I told you to remember that you'd been slaves, you didn't pay any attention. So this is what's gonna happen. King Nebuchadnezzar's gonna come here with his army from Babylon. He's gonna destroy the city. He's gonna take you hostage with, with the rest of the nation and you were gonna go and live as exiles. Well, Zedekiah didn't like to hear that. So he called the people together and he said, listen, this is what's gonna happen. You were gonna let those slaves go. You were gonna set them free. And that means you were going to you are gonna forgive their debts and give them their land back and we're gonna reboot the country and it'll be good. And, and the people said, well, the king wants it, so they did that, but then shortly after they said, no, this is wrong, we want our slaves back. They brought the men and women back into slavery and God said, listen, listen, I am the God who brought you out of slavery from Egypt into the promised land and I told you to remember that you were slaves and to don't let anyone else ever have to live that way. And you did not listen. You did not release the slaves. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna release you. I'm gonna release you to the sword and to famine and to pestilence and Nebuchadnezzar. You are going to Babylon as exiles. Enjoy the moment and don't say that I didn't warn you. According to the book of Jeremiah, 
The exile in Babylon, the destruction of the temple and the city was brought about by the failure of God's people to do justice. And, and, and a bit later, after they come back from exile, with, with the purpose to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city, to build that place that's based on justice and peace, how did that go? It, it did not go well. We look to the book of the prophet Nehemiah, and, and, and we hear in Nehemiah, there was a great outcry of the people. And the people were saying, we are having to pledge our fields, our vineyards, our houses, in order to get grain. And now our flesh, which is the same as our kindred, our children are the same as their children, and yet we are forced to sell our sons and daughters to be slaves. Debt slavery, once again, was the order of the day. Okay, let, let, let's move ahead to New Testament times. Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. And we have talked about the fact that the people of Israel were living under the oppression of Rome. That's true. Caesar was in control. That's true. But one of the things that we need to remember is that the Hebrew people who were at the top of the food chain, they were making out like bandits. Remember the words of Jesus to his disciples when they were outside the temple and he said, listen, the scribes and the Pharisees, they devour widows' houses. They take widows' houses and make them homeless. They put them on the street so that they can line their own pockets. They devour widows' houses. And remember, re remember as he began his ministry, all of these dots connect, folks. You've got to connect the dots. As he began his ministry, remember Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the year, Lord's favor was Jubilee and Jubilee Jubilee was about taking the debts of individuals and releasing them from it to give them a fresh start so that no one, no one would be living under the oppression, the pain, and the shame of poverty. I came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And, and, and then, if that's not enough, what, remember when his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray, and he taught them the Lord's Prayer, and in the middle of it he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. And in our gospel reading today, Peter has been talking about the regular kinds of sin, sex, drugs, rock and roll, but Jesus changes the topic and he begins to talk about the kingdom of God and he talks about the kingdom of God in terms of debt. And I believe what we have here is the proclamation that in the kingdom of God, there will be restorative and distributive justice. In the kingdom of God, the pain, the hardship of living under oppressive debt will be taken away. In the kingdom of God, there will be no man, woman, or child who does without. In the kingdom of God, all will live life and live it abundantly. And let's be clear, part of what Matthew's saying is that in the kingdom of God, there is no room for those who would cause pain or shame or suffering or humiliation. Okay, let's take a quick look at our day. So how are we doing? I would say not so well. 
There are a staggering number of nations in our world today that live under crushing debt that sucks their life, their hope, and their joy away from them, debt that they can never repay. And there are millions of children in those impoverished countries that are living with such poverty that it creates bloated stomachs and vacant eyes. In our own country, one in five children live in poverty. One in two of our First Nations children live in poverty. 1.3 million children live in poverty in our country. I believe our gospel reading today is a clarion call to all who have eyes to see and ears to hear that it is time for something to be done. Now, theologically, logically, morally, it would be a wonderful thing if we could declare a year of jubilee and forgive the debts of all of the impoverished countries who don't have a hope of ever, ever, ever paying the debt back. But that's not going to happen because the leaders of this world and the giant corporations are wanting their pound of flesh. And the more they keep them in poverty, the more they have control and power in the world. That's not going to happen. But what can we do? Do we sit back in despair and say, there's nothing we can do about this? No. You and I, all God's children, we are called to be a voice for the powerless. We need to speak out against injustice. It's not enough just to have soup kitchens and, and food banks. We have got to begin to address the cause, the root cause of human suffering, of poverty, of shame, and lack of dignity. And it's more than writing a check. And it's more than praying for folk as important as both of those things are. We need to be a voice for those who have no voice. We need to demand change. We need to call, to call our leaders to create a world where no one, no one needs to live without, needs to live in shame. Remember, we were once slaves in Egypt, and we must never, never let anyone live that way again. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us remember our faith in the words of Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us pray. God of light and hope, we pray for those who face lives filled with darkness, those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, those bent under burdens of sorrow, those who cannot see the way ahead. We pray for those who accompany others in dark times and places, for those who comfort the grieving and the work for healing and new possibilities. May all these find their darkness transformed by your presence. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of liberation and justice, we pray for those who suffer abuse, violence, or injustice at the hands of powerful people or forces in their lives and for those who have been betrayed by people entrusted with their care. Stir in all people a deep respect for life. Encourage those who struggle for freedom and work for truth to be heard and reconciliation achieved. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of peace and promise, we pray for those whose work for peace in this world for leaders and decision makers, for those who hold power and can make a difference in their communities, and for those who make, interpret, and enforce laws. Awaken a respect for the needs of the most vulnerable, including the earth and its fragile balances. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of wisdom and understanding, we pray for those who misunderstand the words and actions of others, and for those who are misunderstood. We pray for those who teach and those who learn, especially those who struggle and are afraid to ask for help. In this challenging school year, guide teachers and students in new patterns of learning and keep each one safe and healthy. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. God of forgiveness and reconciliation, we pray for those who have been hurt or offended and for those whom we have been unkind. We pray for those who have hurt us or been careless with our feelings. Work in our lives to redeem broken relationships, shape us into gracious and forgiving people. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. In silence, we name before you other concerns on our minds today. Lord, in your love, Hear our prayer. And now, let us pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, may God bless you with discomfort. Discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger, anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. 
May God bless you with tears. Tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And now, may the blessing of the deep mystery we name God, source of life, hope, and love, word of life, and ever-present spirit of grace be upon you and remain with you today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Amen.